there in internet land. Uh, welcome to the conversation brought to you by the Village Rising community. So uh, I'm your host, Daryl Levine, and uh, we talk about, uh, talk with the artists and, uh, and how they affect the culture. And we talk a little bit about their, uh, their upbringing, everything you want to know about the artists uh, and the music mainly, because that's the most important thing is uh you know changing changing lives by playing the music so uh today we have the one and only my guy marion meadows saxophonist extraordinaire <laughs> welcome marion thanks d it's good, good to, to be here brother <laughs> always good. good to have you man well you know we've been friends for a long time Mm -hmm. And I enjoy the fact that uh, you have a show now and that we get a chance to uh, have a conversations like this, because this is important. I believe this this kind of content is important for all of us and especially for, uh, you know, the next generation to to have a treasure chest of uh, these conversations that we're having. They're very valid for the future and they're certainly valid for keeping uh, a tab on on what contributions we've been making as musicians and as human beings. So thank you right. for having me. <laughs> okay. Definitely. Definitely. And, uh, and some people have been requesting, requesting you. So I have to say, I got to get, I got to get married in right away. I was, I was had him, I had you down the line. I was building up, you know, but I said, hey, I gotta get him now. Let's see if we can get him. because, uh, you just came from Seabreeze, right? I did the Seabreeze jazz festival, I believe. Uh, was the first major festival of the season, uh, yeah. indication that uh, we are coming back. The music, uh, of course, the music wasn't going to go anywhere anyway, uh, right. but we're coming back as a community. Mm -hmm. uh, and as you all know, we have a very rich, wonderful community of people who are so giving. So we've missed each other, you know, as our co colleagues, you know, people think we have a big competition. We miss each other. I mean, we're, we are, <laughs> yeah. such, we're such fans and friends of one another uh, that um, it was so nice to see all the, all, all the musicians and the fans, of course. Uh, so here we are, we, we're getting started again. And uh, thanks to Seabase. It was a great festival. Yeah, it was, it was great to see all you cats, man, together, man, y'all, y'all, and every, everybody in white, man, <laughs> just hanging out, man, you know, normal. It must have been a call for white. Everybody had white, though. I don't know who said white that. Was that a plan, or was that, what, what no, was that? I, I, it's just everybody wore white, you know. I don't know. Yeah. Nobody planned that. They yeah, y'all look like y'all was in the Bahamas or something, man. <laughs> that's the mystery. That's the mystery of life, you know. Oh, yeah, you, I don't know. You show was. up every Everybody's got white clothes on. <laughs> well, I thought it was. I thought it was hip, man. I thought it was a plan, you know. So, like, yeah. And you know, Mary, you you have a long illustrious career, man. Uh, talk a little bit about. Are you from the East Coast, right? I am. I am. You are from the East Coast. Talk a little bit about uh, coming up and. Oh, uh, well, you know, being uh, exposed. Well, for me, uh, growing up, I grew up, you know, I was born in West Virginia, mm -hmm. but I was, uh, my dad, uh, we moved from West Virginia. My dad, um, you know, ended up through his journey, moving his family to Connecticut. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, he wanted to get away from coal mining. That's what the industry was there. And uh, so I grew up right outside of New York City in the suburbs called uh, Stanford, Connecticut. And being in and around New York City, I was destined to, you know, if I were going to be a musician, I have to, of course, you know, take the litmus test of whether or not I can prove myself in New York City. And in New York City, they were not forgiving <laughs> at all. When you show up in New York City to, to do a jam session, they tell you to get the heck off the stage. <laughs> but not in those words. It's a little bit more, <laughs> a little bit more, you know, forceful than that. You know, they... But it was certainly a proving ground after my, um, you know, my tenure as a young student on clarinet. And that's where I started. And I and started in an elementary school. And I went to the band teacher on the suggestion from my 
you know, uh, my teacher in uh, third grade who asked me, you know, you know, they gave out the little recorders and she, she was like, you seem to know how to play that little thing. So she suggested that I go ask the band teacher if I could join the band. And I mean, this, this is just a testimony to, to, to how they, how much they paid attention to children back in our day, because we actually had a full band in elementary school, which is, which was amazing. Mm. And, and getting us prepared. And also they had instruments at the school that once you decided that you were going to play an instrument, they gave you an instrument. Although they gave me an old clarinet. <laughs> clarinet was like 1910, you know, it's like Sidney Bechet style. <laughs> but nonetheless, uh, when I first got to the band teacher, I, he said, what do you want to play? And I said, I'm going to play saxophone. <laughs> so he said, man, everybody wants to play the saxophone. We don't have any more saxophone. He goes, we are, I said, what do you got? He said, clarinets. And I said, oh, no, clarinet, man. I, I, I'll, get, I'll get beat up carrying that little case home, that little <laughs> clarinet case. You got to give me something better than that. <laughs> but, but lo and behold, I, I, I did become a clarinet player. And I had a <laughs> private teacher. And my private teacher taught me mostly just classical studies, getting me ready for technique and, you know, reading and all those fundamentals that you needed to have as a, as a budding musician. And um, and that was the foundation. And you know how we all encourage our young students to get that foundation, get your reading foundation, get your time, all of those things, all of your scales and 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 prepare yourself for ne the next step, which was to get your tone, you know, and, you, you know, you got to get that nice tone and it's a horn. So I actually had very good teachers who helped me get a round tone and a, and a good, you know, fundamental base. Uh, and so it was really actually not until high school that I even picked up a saxophone. I picked up my first saxophone in my uh, sophomore year in uh, high school. And of course, as soon as you do that, you're in every band because now you play clarinet and saxophone. So you're in the orchestra, you're in the concert band, you're in the jazz band. <laughs> well, I lived in the music department in high school, which was so cool because when you, I was really a science student in school. I was not really preparing myself to be a professional musician unbeknownst to me, but I was preparing myself because I was being trained properly as a young musician to be a music student, uh, which I chose later. Uh, it, it was my senior year of high school that I even thought about the, the possibility of becoming a professional musician and going off to music school. I, actually, all of my preparation up until that time was to go into animal science, and I was just, you know, I I was pretty much just animal trying. To, wow. Yeah, I wanted to I wanted to be a zoo vet, and you know, yeah. and I and I thought that that was going to be a, you know I had to really in order to do those kinds of gigs, you had to have all your math mm -hmm. and your science and your chemistry, and your biology, and all that stuff mm -hmm. together by the time you headed off to your undergrad. So I was mm -hmm. you know thinking that that's what I needed to do, but at the right. same time I was playing music. And uh, and here, here I was at this crossroads to make a decision that my parents, um, you know, when I first told my mom, I was on a trip with my high school band to Europe that summer as a kind of a treat for graduating. And we were musicians who had actually been at a festival the year before and were invited back again the senior year. And they wrote an article about me in an Italian uh, newspaper. This young, you know, 18 year old kid, you know, had a nice sound. It was going to be a famous music. Of course, I couldn't read it in Italian, but I called my mom and said, Ma, they wrote about me in the uh, Italian newspaper. And then she says, you know, you, you got a letter from that little Berkeley School of Music. She called everything little. My horn was a little, like a little floor. <laughs> no, little yeah. school. She goes, that little music school wrote you a letter and they accepted you. And I was like, really? And I said, well, maybe I'll go to music school. She hung up on me. <laughs> <laughs> well, man, you know, you and you that was, I mean, that was a great, that was actually a good foundation. You've been through all of those different uh, experiences when you were young and those different types of bands, concert band. And that's how we did in high school, you know, and yes. your instrument was definitely needed. <laughs> as part of, the, <laughs> part of our ensemble, definitely. So you would work double time, triple time. Yeah, oh God, I was working. And triple time. I was working overtime. And actually my music teacher, who was truly my mentor, and I wasn't really appreciating it at that age, used to come to my house after school and give me extra lessons 
and he had his own family at home. So there were there were about there were about six or seven of us from Connecticut that were under his tutelage that he thought would go the next you know to the next level. And so he took it upon himself to come to our house and to to my house and give me lessons after school, you know. And of course, my parents encouraged it. But I now, in hindsight, I'm thinking this guy, you know, been home at dinner with his own family, but he's doing this with several other kids as well. So what a what an incredible uh, caveat to what I already had going on, which was already cool, and mm-hmm. to get this little extra push from my truly my mentor, and his name was Anthony Trugley, who I sat on the board of a, of a, of, of a group called Project Music in Stanford, Connecticut, uh, in honor of him. Uh, and we, we do music, uh, we provide instruments and music lessons for kids who can't otherwise afford that. Uh, and uh, so that's in, in honor of him, you know. Yeah, man. So we fast forward to your uh, first, uh, the first tune we played was uh, For Lovers Only which one of, one of your first uh, first hits, actually one of the first uh, first charted hits, actually. Uh, yeah. You, yeah. Am I am I correct? Absolutely. It was yeah. it was my uh, it was my foray into being a solo artist uh, via uh, RCA Records on the Novus label. I was signed by Steve Backer, and as quiet as it's kept, Steve Backer had flown me down. We had had a couple of meetings. And he had some business in New Orleans. <laughs> and he he flew me down all the way down there to tell me that he was gonna give me a record deal. So it was so everything was 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 so passionate back in those days, you know, with the, the artists. Oh, yeah. It was truly it was truly an experience because he wasn't he was a guy who had signed uh, Roy Hargrove and Antonio Hart and yeah. you know, so here he was, you know, gonna you know go with some contemporary guys like me and Alex yeah. Bunyon and mm-hmm. eventually Warren Hill. But he only signed a couple of us. And so that was, you know, he, he spent a lot of time to, you know, want, wanting to know where we were in terms of our vision for, for mm-hmm. our future. And mm-hmm. um, what a cool guy he was. And RCA Records, what a blessing that was, because we came in when there were over 300 radio stations available for the kind of music that we played, or even contemporary. And then mm-hmm. artists had, you had two publicists on both posts and you had, a big giant machine behind you, and you came in selling. You know, you, you, your freshman uh, outing would be a hundred, two hundred thousand records sold. You know, it's crazy. That's what, and and, and, I, and I, I tell people that that's when you had like uh, serious people who loved music that was at the top and executive level. Yes, you know? yes. And at that Absolutely. time, man, you know, yes. they, they guided the careers, man, of, and they yes. really, really put like good things out. You know, all the time, mostly all the time. You know, I mean, yeah, some I things crap shoot, but you know, but they put they put a lot of good stuff out for the most part, and they were very discerning, you know, as to yeah. what they did and what they picked. So they yeah, truly that, invested in the in a record. They they would invest in a in a jazz record as they would a pop record. You know, if, if right. it wasn't right, they'd go back and get it right. You know, because so, obviously they could afford to do that. And so, therefore, the records did have a quality control that was a little, you know, that was uh, something that you kind of took for granted that, you know, you knew that the record company was going to take an interest via, like you say, the executives who signed you in the first place. In my case, it would have been Steve Backer, who I answered to. And so, therefore, he would he, he, would, he would say, uh, look, you know, uh, and we worked and to get the material right. And um, it was great. It was a great experience. And it was a great experience to be around. You know, he was mixing us together as a community with, you know, Roy Hart, young Roy Hargrove, who was 